All right, let's answer some questions though. And I have several that I noticed. I usually don't look at these ahead of time. This time I did a little bit and uh, off we go. PFTP and Possum. Where do the Cowboys fans go from here? It's the same thing every year and it's becoming unenjoyable. Has the star become so big that the pressure from the playoffs is too much since a Cowboys loss is bigger news than most other team wins? That gets back to something that Dak Prescott said during the season. He kind of blamed the media for hyping up the Cowboys when things were going well and setting them up to step into a trap, which is just kind of ludicrous when you think of it. It's our fault. It's the fans' fault for saying Cowboys are great, Cowboys are great, Cowboys are great. It's on you, the team, the players, the coaches, to get – that noise to be ignored and to always be looking for something to have a chip on your shoulder about. Find something negative out there. Some moron who dares to say that the opposing team is going to kick the shit out of you, for example. Find anything you can to try to keep your edge. And they are, and it's not really victimized because it's great for their business. They make a ton more money selling stuff. They have a much greater following. The numbers that they generate are off the charts. The team is more valuable. I've wondered from time to time whether this whole Jerry Jones, I really want to win a Super Bowl. I'd write a check the size of which you wouldn't be able to imagine if it guaranteed winning a Super Bowl, yada, yada. I think there's a chance he's just being a very good and very aggressive carnival barker because he understands he's got to sell. In order to get the fans fully engaged, he's got to be fully engaged because he's the fan in chief. You need people to show up and spend money on tickets that are expensive. You need people to buy a bunch of expensive crap at the game. I still remember 13 years ago, getting a tub of a couple day old popcorn, frankly, at the Super Bowl at Jerry World for 15 bucks. And it was, you know how when popcorn starts to get to that point where it's lost its freshness and it's kind of squeaky, it was 15 bucks. So you need people to go and spend, and watch your games on TV, and buy jerseys, and get excited, and be excited, and be engaged. I don't know. I. It came up earlier. I was on the score in Chicago. There's a thought that Jerry Jones won't pay the Mike McCarthy buyout, that that's what's going to save him. He'd have to pay Mike McCarthy for one year. Jerry didn't like to do that. Well, I mean, if you truly want to upgrade, who cares? Who cares? That money is nothing. He's got a half billion dollar yacht for crying out loud. Does he really want, as he said it back in 2012, glory hole? Or does he just want more money? And, you know, I, I, I feel bad for him if he truly is tormented by losing every year. He's at the point in his life where he should be able to enjoy himself. He's been successful, wildly successful, successful enough to buy the team. He's been a great representative of the NFL. He's innovated things. The team has grown and grown. He's got so much money. He, Anytime you have a half billion dollar yacht, you've won the game. At some point, you can, you know, take a victory lap and enjoy yourself. But he creates the impression he's tormented by these losses, as the fans are. And I don't know that it gets any better anytime soon, especially if they stick all due respect with Mike McCarthy. All right. PFTP and Posse, how much money did Dan Quinn potentially cost himself with the performance of the Cowboys defense this past week, considering he's a hot candidate this cycle, particularly for the Seattle job? Miles Simmons and I were talking about this today on PFT Live. How do you sell Dan Quinn to the Seahawks fan base? How do you sell Dan Quinn to the owner of the Seahawks after 48 points were allowed by the Packers? I think that makes it harder for Quinn to get the job in Seattle or to stick around and be the successor to Mike McCarthy. Dr. J144, the Jim Irsay situation seems to be quite sensitive and understandably so. Reminds me of when Tom Brady got divorced and nobody wanted to break it. How do you personally handle reporting versus being respectful in sensitive situations like those? It's case by case. It's guided by our sense of what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, what's right, what's wrong. In a situation like this, where you're talking about a serious illness and there's no information being provided by the Colts or the family, we just sit back and wait. Now, there are reports out there regarding official documentation created when the 911 call resulted in a finding of Jim Irsay being non-responsive in his bed. His skin was blue. It sounds bad. We're not going to fill in the gaps with speculation. We're not going to fill in the gaps with rumor. We're going to sit back and wait for whatever official information 
comes out. And, and with a case like Brady, it became fair game because it seemed to be so intertwined with what was going on with the Buccaneers. His wife was a public figure, even more prominent than him. He was talking about it. It just made it feel like fair game. For most players, you don't want to touch it. For most of these things, you just try to be guided by, and I got 12 years of Catholic school. I feel guilty about everything. I worry about everything. You try to be guided by your innate sense of what's right and what's wrong when you're talking about a delicate situation like this. And you do take it case by case, and you hope that you ultimately make the right decision. Manuel Villa, as a loyal watcher and reader of PFT for five years now, I am curious as to which stories over the last 20 years stand out or elevated PFT to what it is today. Well, I was just thinking about sensitive stories. We killed Terry Bradshaw 17 years ago when there was a report from Shreveport that what it was was someone had died in an accident on the Terry Bradshaw Passway. One of the TV stations in Shreveport reported it as Terry Bradshaw had died. There was a report out there that was the anchor for what we posted. But instead of checking with Fox, which I could have done very easily to confirm that Terry Bradshaw was indeed still alive, I posted it. And that's one of the things we've learned. And that's why we're very careful about what reports we use and who we credit and who we don't. And there are certain reporters we shy away from when they have a track record of, frankly, not being right about things. If you're not right about things and we write about it and it ends up coming to fruition, we get blamed as much or more than you do. I can't even remember the name of the station in Shreveport that put out the idea convoluting someone died on the Terry Bradshaw passway to Terry Bradshaw passed away as I, I don't remember. What, all I know is we did it. All that matters is we did it. Doesn't matter who originally did it. We took it and we ran with it. And that's something that I'll never be able to live down. Um, one of the news stories slash rumors that I think helped make a difference for us was when we reported in early 2005, the Vikings were exploring a trade of Randy Moss and that the prime candidates were the Raiders. We were out in front of that by a week or so. And it was one of those that just sounded shocking when it came out initially, but it came to fruition. The Mike Vick saga, and I remember when his cousin was arrested for marijuana possession, they came to the house and they discovered the dogfighting operation at the home in Surrey County, Virginia, that Mike Vick owned. And Vick just denied everything. It was right around the draft. Commissioner asked him about it, lied to his face, don't know anything about it. And I remember thinking, and this was when I was still actively practicing law, so I was in that mindset, I was in that world more, thinking, how hard would it be to prove that he knows damn well what's going on on this property that he owns. How many different gas stations, convenience stores, grocery stores, restaurants did he use a credit card over the years that would be very easy to track down that he was there? Because once you understand the layout of the land, there's no way he could have ever gone there and not known there was a dogfighting operation. So I had a very strong instinct from the get-go that he was involved heavily in the dog fighting and we pushed it and we pushed it and we pushed it. And some think, I don't believe it, but I know some think the feds wouldn't have even gotten involved because the local prosecutors seem to be inclined to just look the other way on it and not prosecute for whatever reason, whatever reason, maybe the prosecutor just didn't want to have to deal with a Mike Vick legal dream team because prosecutors are paid salary. They don't get extra money for taking on a high profile case where you're fending off some of the best lawyers money can buy. Regardless, it felt like the local prosecutor was going to let it go. Gerald Poindexter was his name, I believe. And some think the feds got involved specifically because I kept banging on this and banging on this. But regardless, that was one that gathered a lot of credibility for us because our instincts were right. And we pushed it and we pushed it and we pushed it. And then it all popped and it vindicated everything that we had believed based upon the evidence that was coming out one news cycle at a time as this thing was unfolding pre-Twitter in Surrey County, Virginia. Those are just a couple that come to mind. I'm sure there have been more. It's been 23 years, and I'm starting to forget things. Dr. J144, again, why do people on social media think it's funny when Bills fans throw snowballs at Steeler players or an Eagles fan dumps a tub of popcorn on Nick Sirianni? Is the NFL concerned we will get a Ron Artest situation at some point? There have been 
incidents that became close. There was a Jaguars player at one point that was trying to get up into the stands. All you can do in a situation like that is take action against the fan that does the thing you shouldn't do. And there's cameras everywhere. Hey, we talked about this not long ago in a different context. A fan at Gillette Stadium who threw a beer on Tyreek Hill, banned for life and prosecuted or at least charged. A fan in Cleveland who threw a beer on, I believe, Logan Ryan, then with the Titans, banned indefinitely from the stadium there. Oh, and David Tepper throws a drink on a paying customer at the Panthers-Jaguars game and gets a $300,000 fine, which is pocket change for him and no suspension at all. So I think that the stadium authorities, teams, et cetera, should be vigilant about taking action at anyone who crosses that line. The guy who threw the popcorn, even though it was a bad pass. I mean, you throw up this cloud of popcorn and it lands five feet in front of Nick Sirianni. You got to work on your aim a little bit. Regardless, you crossed the line. You should be. Ban and if it's somebody from Philadelphia, who cares? But what they should do is someone who does that should be banned from all stadiums everywhere. It shouldn't just be the one where it happened. You should be permanently banned from ever going to another NFL game. You forfeited your privilege of buying a ticket and going to the game because Fans think that when they've paid that money, it gives them a birthright to act like assholes, to yell and scream hateful things, to throw things if they, and throwing things does cross the line, but just some of the, the verbal taunts that get directed to players. You feel like you have every right to do it. You feel like you're supporting the team if you try to knock the other team off of its game. It's just, uh, it's, it's sad and it happens. At least when someone crosses the line and throws something, that's when the NFL should mobilize and it should be a ban for life from every stadium if someone does it. And that should apply to owners too. Keith the Z, do you think receivers are now like the proverbial canary in a coal mine as they can sense when something is off on an offense before the public does? AJ Brown, Stephon Diggs, George Pickens. I don't know that they're the canary in the coal mine. They're they're the symptom of the disease. That's where it becomes most obvious. They're the chest pains of a heart attack because you've got receivers who are upset that they're not getting the ball. And look, you can say they're being selfish. The reality is a great receiver believes that in order to win games, which is what we're trying to do, you need to get me the ball. If you get me the ball more often, we're more likely to win games. So it creates frustration when the great receiver isn't getting the ball. The offense isn't moving. The team isn't successful. Losses happen. So I don't call it canary in a coal mine as much as I view it as a symptom of a disease, a deeper issue that needs to be resolved. If you have a great receiver and you're not getting the ball to that great receiver, you've got a problem with your offense. Because if nothing else, even if the guy's not getting open down the field because he's being double covered or triple covered everywhere he goes, you can scheme the offensive plays to get the ball in his hands and let him do what he does. Short pass, jet sweep, put him in the backfield, whatever the case may be, you can get that player involved. All right, what else do we have? Kushman Zada, based on the positive organizational culture we're seeing in extremely good personnel, offices of both teams, do you think the NFC rivalry of the 2020s is going to be San Francisco and Detroit? I still have concerns about how far Jared Goff can take the Lions. I need to see him make a big throw in a big spot. I need to see him exercise the demons of Super Bowl 53 when he had Brandon Cooks wide open twice on the same play, first half and second half. And surely in the second half, they spent some of the 25 minutes of halftime saying we're going to use this play again. And this time, Jared, Brandon Cooks will be wide open. You got to get it to him. He saw him too late. He threw it off the mark. Jason McCourty ran over and picked it off. And that was that. He makes that throw to Cooks in that moment. They might have won the Super Bowl. Jared Cooks might still be Jared Cooks. Jared Goff might still be. Jared Cook was the tight end in the NFL for several years. Jared Goff might still be. Brandon, that's why I did it. Brandon Cooks, Jared Goff, Jared Cooks, Jared Cook. Jared Goff might still be the quarterback of the Rams. Kyle Schrader. If it's up to you, who do you hire at offensive coordinator for the Steelers and what do you do at quarterback? I mean, it's not up to me and Steelers fans everywhere should be glad about that. I think I would definitely want to have a coordinator who has a plan for getting the most out of my quarterback, whoever it is. That's where it becomes a little backward because you're going to have to go out and hire a coordinator without knowing who your quarterback is unless you're going to commit to one of the guys you currently have. And I wouldn't necessarily commit to one of the guys you currently have. All due respect to Kenny Pickett, there's nothing he does that makes you say, wow, I can't wait for him to do that again. 
It's very meat and potatoes between the buoys, not spectacular offensive play. Now, do you have a coordinator who has a certain system? And then do you go out into free agency and find someone you know who can run it? That's one way to go, but there's no guarantee you're going to get the guy who can run the system that the coordinator is running. So I would want a coordinator and a quarterback who can work together well, similar system, plays designed to get the most out of the quarterback, plays designed to not put him in a position to do things he can't do well. That's the key to good offensive football, in my opinion. Matt Kavner of the eight teams left, which are in the now or never considering their Super Bowl window. You know, I was thinking about this earlier. This is one of the ones I saw. I wouldn't say any of them are really in a now or never. I don't think any of them are on the brink of dismantling if they don't get it done. Let's run through them real quickly. The Texans, they're on the rise. The Ravens have a great nucleus of talent they're holding together. The Bills and the Chiefs are still firmly in the window because of the quarterbacks they have. It's not now or never for either of those teams as long as they have those two quarterbacks in Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes. In the NFC, the 49ers, George Kittle said before the season that their window's closing, but I think he's referring to the older players. They're going to load it up with younger players. They've got the formula there to find the right players to come in, work with Kyle Shanahan. He puts together great plays on offense. The defense has been great. I don't think their window's closing. The Packers feel like the arrow's pointing up. The Lions feel like the arrow's pointing up. And the Bucks. I guess, but it's still not now or never. I feel like with Baker Mayfield, they could build something where they could be a force in the NFC for years to come. Dr. J144, would you rather have Trevor Lawrence or CJ Stroud for the next 10 years? One was billed as a generational talent and the other the media seemed to slow to warm up to because people thought Bryce Young was better and they don't like being wrong. I mean, I, mean, I think it's a no brainer. I want C.J. Stroud, all due respect to Trevor Lawrence. C.J. Stroud is already one of the best five quarterbacks in the NFL. Now, it's easy to say that without listing five quarterbacks, because when you start listing the best five quarterbacks in the NFL, you end up with 10 of them. But he's one of the top 10, maybe one of the top five. I, I, I would clearly take him right now over Trevor Lawrence, even though Trevor Lawrence played through a lot of injuries this year, and maybe that had something to do with the Jaguars collapsing. I still would want C.J. Stroud right now, based upon what we've seen so far. All right, I should probably wrap this up soon. NFL leads, thoughts on Jason Light for executive of the year. Baker Mayfield was a bargain. Brady dead cap money. 10 starters from the last two drafts. I, I hadn't really thought about it before, and he wasn't on any of the ballots for our executive of the year. It's weird that the AP slash NFL official awards don't include executive of the year. That was like traditionally a sporting news thing, if sporting news is even still around. So we do it every year. This year, we had Eric DaCosta in large part for navigating the minefield that was the Lamar Jackson contract and relationship. Get to a point where you have a contract he's happy with, you haven't undermined the relationship, you put him at risk of someone else swooping in and signing him to an offer sheet you couldn't or wouldn't match. Nobody did. It was played perfectly. Everything else around Lamar Jackson, they've got a great team. They're the best team in the NFL right now, as evidenced by what they did to the 49ers on Christmas night. So I like the idea of Jason Light. I just think that, you know, barely making it to the playoffs in the week's division of football doesn't make you stand out the way it does if you capture the one seed in the AFC like the Ravens did. Silvestro, Jamie, eight. Haven't heard much about Mike Vrabel interviewing anywhere. What's going on with that? Also, can the Chargers actually land Jim Harbaugh? There's a lot of smoke there, but it always is something with the Chargers, or it's always something, the Roseanne, Roseanne, and Dana catchphrase. That's what that's what uh, the reference is there. Hope they don't mess it up. Okay, let me start with Vrabel. The Raiders possibility is intriguing, although the signs are pointing to Antonio Pierce possibly getting the job, possibly by the time you see this. Vrabel would be great there. Vrabel intriguing in Seattle if they decide they can't go after Dan Quinn because of the 48-point debacle in Dallas on Sunday. If And, and I'm not saying Andy Reid's going to retire, but if he does, and I think there's reason to believe that the Chiefs at least have it on the radar screen of possible outcomes once this season ends, Mike Vrabel would make sense there too. He played there for a couple of years. And why wouldn't Vrabel want that job? It's got Patrick Mahomes. You have Patrick Mahomes, you got a chance to compete for Super Bowls each and every year. As to the Chargers and Harbaugh, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen there. Look, they got a great quarterback. 
but I still think there's reason to believe there's plenty of dysfunction in the organization. Will it scare Harbaugh away if he has other choices? The Falcons have interviewed him. We'll see who else does. Maybe the Raiders get involved. I thought it was going to come down to Chargers, Raiders. That was the early buzz. Chargers or Raiders. And maybe that's going to be the case. But now you got the Falcons in play. Other teams might get interested. The guy's a proven winner. He turned the 49ers around immediately. Just won the national championship. At a time when the culture of college football has changed dramatically with NIL. And as those players come to the NFL, you need somebody who knows how to get guys to set aside their own personal interests and focus on team and put the team above whatever it is they're trying to do. RDW, what would be a drop dead date that if Mike McCarthy is not gone, he's not going to be? I I really don't know. We've seen late firings in the past. And if the Cowboys have it lined up behind the scenes who they're going to replace him with, you could string it out. Ideally, you'd like to have a coaching staff in place before the senior bowl, but a lot of teams don't. You definitely want to have it in place by the scouting combine. So I don't know that there is a drop dead date, but I just think it makes sense. Unless Jerry Jones likes the fact that his team will be the center of attention while we all sit back and wonder what the Cowboys are going to do. I mean, he can milk this thing for a few weeks before he makes a decision on Mike McCarthy. So we'll see. I don't know that there is one. Brady Romero nine is what the Crafts did to hire Gerard Mayo having a succession plan in place, a loophole to the Rooney rule. It just kind of seems like it violates the spirit of the rule and are the Crafts a little more involved and hands-on than most realize. Well, they might be more involved moving forward, but it was clear that Bill Belichick was running the show before he was let go and, or they had a mutual parting. The succession plan for Gerard Mayo is legitimate and it does count as an exception to the Rooney rule. It's happened before. Jim Caldwell got the Colts job after Tony Dungy in 2009 with a pre-existing succession plan in place with a contract that was signed, sealed, and delivered to the league office. Jim Mora, the younger, after Mike Holmgren in Seattle, even though he lasted only one year before Pete Carroll got the job. And when Eric DaCosta became the GM of the Ravens, same thing. The Patriots had the deal in place. Pre-written, pre-committed, sent to the league office, To the point where if they would have opened the job up for a search, they would have had to write Gerard Mayo a very large check. They made a contractual commitment to him that he was going to be the next coach. If they had decided not to, whatever's in the contract would have determined what his buyout would have been. It's legitimate. Whether you like it or not, it doesn't violate the spirit of the rule or the letter of the rule because it specifically is allowed by the rule. All right. Ryan Nizette, will Joe Flacco or DeMar Hamlin be the comeback player of the year? Yeah, we're not supposed to talk about our ballots or who we voted for or whether there's someone else that was our first choice. The comeback player of the year is very vaguely defined. It can be whatever you want it to be. There's a chance by next year, there's a chance that will either be greater guidance or maybe another category, something like most improved player and comeback player of the year. But but still, it's kind of in the eye of the beholder as to what comeback means. Initially, it looked like this was DeMar Hamlin's, guaranteed. All you got to do is make the team and play in a game and you're the comeback player of the year. Well, when you're playing 17 snaps on defense for the full season, it's a little harder to make the argument. And guys like Joe Flacco or Baker Mayfield become the candidates for comeback player of the year. Matthew Stafford potential comeback player of the year. We'll find out on February 8th. All right. I should probably. Here's one, David Mitchell. Assuming the new Washington head coach does not retain Eric the enemy, offensive coordinator, have you heard anything on where he might land? He might quietly be in the mix for the Washington job or the Atlanta job, but it's just, it's never happened for him. It's so weird. And here's what will be very interesting. If Andy Reid should happen to retire, do they bring Eric Bieniemy back to be the head coach? And if Reid stays, would they bring him back to be the offensive coordinator if there is no head coaching opportunity for Eric Bieniemy? Something to keep an eye on. All right. I'm just scrolling here to see if there's one last question to answer. How about this? Justin Pursuti, would the NFL ever consider hosting the Super Bowl in a cold weather city again like they did Super Bowl 48 at MetLife State? And we know... That year, they dodged a bullet by just like a day or two. I remember being up there for Super Bowl week, and then 
a few days after the Super Bowl, I guest hosted for Dan Patrick, whose studio is in Milford, Connecticut. And I remember being in the car back and forth hotel up there. And the, there was one day where it was just snow and slush and crap the whole way. So it could have been very bad. They wanted to do it one time as an experiment. I remember the league telling me when I raised concerns about the potential weather consequences. And this was when, remember in December of 2010, right around Christmas time, a blizzard hit Philadelphia and New York. And it was like 25 inches. We had Vikings at Eagles on Sunday night. They moved that game to Tuesday. We actually took the train down, did the pregame and postgame from Lincoln Financial Field. I asked the league whether or not they had any second thoughts about Super Bowl 48 being at MetLife Stadium. And the quote that I got on the record from the league was, we are the ultimate reality show. So they kind of like that, but not enough to even breathe a word at the possibility of the game being played open air in a northern city. Now, northern cities get the game as the quid pro quo for a new domed stadium like Minnesota did, like Ford Field did, like the Silver Dome before that, like the Metro Dome before that. They get one, the Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. Even though that was a great experience, it was really cold, didn't snow. And in the aftermath of that game from 12 years ago, the vibe was, oh, they'll definitely get another one. Nope, hasn't happened. So it's tough for a cold weather city to get, even with a dome, more than the one that's kind of loosely promised when the local taxpayers open up the checkbook to help pay for the stadium. All right, let's call it there. If I didn't get to your question and it's still relevant next week, ask it then. Check us out around the clock at profootballtalk.com. On Thursday, quick preview, PFT Live with Chris Sims, 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern. And then later in the day, the Joint Mega Picks podcast looking at the divisional round games. With plenty of time to talk about each one, only four games this weekend. We'll have some fun doing that. We appreciate some of your time. We'll be open all the time at profootballtalk.com with all the latest news, information, analysis, with everything happening in the NFL. We try to spot it quickly and get it posted so you can read it right away. We appreciate you for doing it, and we'll see you next time. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.